So Lucky Dubé, victim of the kind of gun violence that has come to represent a lot of black notions in the Caribbean, in America, and South Africa, but definitely outside of Africa, these kinds of gun violence and murder has now come to represent kind of a black machismo, tough guy badmanism, right? But at the same time, murder seems to also represent notions of national and cultural freedom that are also incomplete, right? So this allows me to start thinking through the death of Lucky Dubé about the legacies of black global politics, particularly what was called Pan-Africanism, a term I hope you know, and this thing called the African diaspora, a term that I hope you also know. The idea of a global spread of Africans constructing a kind of culture, right? Well, that's quite different for Africans who may not have direct access to this notion of diaspora, but also this notion of Africa. So the essay is really about the strange and curious process by which a vision of Africa and roots from outside of Africa gets taken back to Africa and a romanticized vision, fantasy Africa, goes back to Africa and how do Africans use, abuse, or make sense of this Africa that is not the place they live in, right? That tricky, tricky little thing is what motivates so much of the work that I do as a writer, but also with the music stuff that I'm involved in too. Because this is interesting because for someone like Lucky Dubé, a South African, you'd imagine, well, there's no question, he's South African, he's truly black, right? Well, no, he's Zulu, right? He was Zulu, that's quite distinct, right? But because for Lucky Dubé, <clears throat> despite the fact that he adopted the Rastafari notion of Africa, the fact that he grew dreadlocks, and the fact that he used all the images of Africa, the images of Africa, the map of Africa, the colors of Africa, the language of, Jama of Africa, he and other African reggae artists throughout the 80s, and actually going back to the 70s, they actually struggled to be taken seriously by Jamaicans, right? Because the tragedy for Africans is that they're not fantasy Africans, they're tragically literal Africans, right? And that's the difficulty for someone like Lucky Dubé, right? He was merely a real African, right? Because in the African world, what really mattered was this poetic fantasy Africa. And so when Africans show up to do reggae and to sport dreadlocks, for a lot of Caribbean people, it was a curious thing, an odd thing, right? So regardless of his talent, or their talent, and the depth of their political commitment, the primary handicap of African reggae would come from it not being produced by slavery, right? For it not being produced by all of the themes of exile and trauma and violence and racism that emerged after the African slave trade. Now at this point, it's important for me to make clear that Africa, the notion of this Thing, the map. When I say Africa, you all have conjured a map in your mind, right? Because we're products of all of this. That didn't exist in people's minds for a very long time, right? The notion of Africa is this whole thing, right? As a, what I would call a possible singularity, right? Two things created that more than anything else. I read it borrows from this. First, colonialism. During colonialism, they envisioned this notion of a conceptually containable content, continent, right? A place that if you think of it as one, you could control it as one. And if you think of it as a whole, you could then parcel it up into small bits and share with other colonialists, right? So it was a concept that colonialism really constructed that Africans had nothing to do with, right? That's important to always remember, right? The second thing that influences this notion of Africa that we all share here is, in fact, a lot of political movements that came from the black world. Things like, and I'll just throw some names, Ethiopianism. Ethiopianism is a very important 19th century black cultural movement that influenced Rastafari and reggae music. Ethiopianism, right? We have Ethiopianism. We have Pan-Africanism, something in the French word called negritude. Of course, we have black power, civil rights, and in Cuba we had something called Negrismo in the 1950s, right? All of these black movements resisted colonialism, which created this fixed, this fixed image of Africa. Well, a lot of these black political and artistic movements decided, well, we're going to reject what white people say, 
by creating our own image of Africa. The great irony is that they did the same thing. <laughs> they both did the same thing, but for different purposes. Right? Now, all of these things feed directly into reggae music. Right? That's the beautiful thing about reggae music in that it comes from all of these radical and complicated political movements and religious movements that the people just kind of brought into the music. Right? One of the things that brings me to my own work as a writer and an artist is really the, the, the understanding that coded in the baseline is complicated historical choices made by black people in the Caribbean and throughout the world. Coded in the mixing board and how you separate space right? are these understandings of distance and culture. Right? So all of these things feed into Roots Reggae sound, the ideology and the politics. Right. Now, one of the things that people don't pay enough attention to, though, is that, yes, you have all these political movements that I've just mentioned, and a lot of them are artistic movements, too. But one of the ways that the whole world, the black world, came to understand these political movements was through music. Right? Very few people had access to books and to texts or to literacy. They're not literate people. Right? So to understand Ethiopianism, Pan-Africanism, black power, negritude, the vast majority of black people on the planet came to understand these things, or at least those who did come to understand them, came to understand them through records, right? through music, not through books. Books, the elite were able to have access to the texts, but for most people, it was the music. Reggae wasn't the first. It's there in jazz, it's there in calypso, it's there in all kinds of music, it's there in soca, though tragically less so in soca, but music is so crucial to spreading the global understanding of these political movements, but also this vision of Africa, right? And keep in mind, the interest here is, what do Africans do with a vision of Africa that comes from outside? So reggae has had a dominant influence on not only advocating for Africa before and since and during decolonization, but my arguments are based on the, un the understanding that what reggae helped do in Africa was to replace the Africa that was created by colonialism with a fantasy Africa, right? But that was a very important political move, to replace the dominant idea of Africa that colonialism set forth with a possible Africa that didn't exist but could, right? A fantasy Africa, but a political fantasy, right? So, more so than any other earlier musical form, Roots Reggae, and I think you would agree, Roots Reggae kind of invites itself to Africa. Right? There's something about the music that seems quite bold, if not arrogant, in saying, we are African. Right? Imagine yourself as a person in West Africa, in Nigeria, in 1962, or 1965, or 1970, hearing this strange music from these Jamaicans. You don't even know if there's a place called Jamaica. You never heard of Jamaica. But you hear this music of people saying, I am an African. This is my home. <laughs> you understand how strange it must seem to Afri Africans? The fact that you're chuckling is good. It's very healthy. Because people don't realize how strange it is for reggae to be based on an understanding of Africa that Africans don't have. Right? And this is good and bad. I'm celebrating it, but I'm also criticizing it. 